What's up, everybody? It's Dr. Zubin Nemanja, a.k.a. ZDog MD, and I am just an icon, okay? And <laughs> that will be explained at the end, by watching this episode. I'm here with Professor of Cognitive Sciences at the University of California, Irvine, and a personal intellectual hero of mine, no bias here, Dr. Donald Hoffman. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Zubin. It was a pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Man, it's, it's really crazy to have you in my garage because yeah. I've seen your TED Talk, I've watched, I've been to workshops with you, yeah. I've read your book, The Case Against Reality, yeah. Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. And what you've kind of proposed, and again, we, we may be wrong here, but yeah. it's the one thing that's actually felt right to me about yeah. the nature of reality, that we don't see it as it actually is. Right. In other words, we yeah. don't see truth, we see a graphical user interface that is a series of icons that are tuned mm -hmm. to keep us alive and reproducing, but not tuned to show us the truth. And the underlying truth that is there may be much more interesting than we think. So yes. let's start with that. How did you even get interested in studying this? Well, I was interested in perception and artificial intelligence and the question, are we machines? Are people just machines, or is there something more to us than just machines? And and so I was, as a teenager, I was very interested in these questions. I was programming, so I knew what programs could do a bit. And But I was also, you know, my dad was a fundamentalist minister, so there were all these other aspects of his spirituality or, or religion that were interesting about human nature. And I was trying to put all this stuff together, so I, I would... On the one side, with programming and, and the new kinds of capacities of artificial intelligence, it was looking like we might be machines. On the other hand, there's supposed to be something about us that's beyond the machine. And so I was very, very curious. And so I started, I went to UCLA and did an undergraduate degree in which I was studying computer science, mathematics, with a major in psychology. And then I went to MIT, where I went to the artificial intelligence laboratory and what's now the brain and cognitive science department. And so I was able to then study both the brain and cognitive sciences aspect of, of human nature and the artificial intelligence kinds of models of, of intelligence, trying to put together a picture of, of who we are, what is human nature, what, what are we? Are we just machines? Are we just biological machines? Are we just computers? Or is there something beyond the space-time physical machine? And I wasn't sure, but I kept pursuing the mathematical models. And in 1986... My collaborators and I actually had a mathematical model. And studying it, talking with my collaborators, I realized that the mathematics was saying to me, what you are seeing may not be the truth. And I still remember the moment when I realized what the math was saying. I wasn't trying to get there with the math. It was just, I was just trying to get a general theory of perception mathematically. And when I realized the math was saying you don't necessarily see the truth, I had to sit down. It was such a shock to the system. And so that was 1986, that was 33 years ago. I've been now following that thread for 33 years and seeing where it takes me, and it's pretty interesting. So, so basically that math was like a red pill back then. I, I took the red pill, or, or at least it was put in my mouth. I don't know if I swallowed it completely, but I, but I was concerned enough that I wanted to look into it. Do you ever feel like you wish you were back, you you had never taken it, and you were just like everybody else? Oh, no, no. It, it, the blue pill is boring. Uh, and so I don't want to be there. I, I want to actually, whatever reality might be, if it's uncomfortable, I'm I'm ready to go and find out what it's like. So yeah. So so you know, and that and that brings me to how I first got introduced to you. So um, Tony Shea, who I used to work with at Zappos, I think had uh, sent me. He's the CEO of Zappos. He had oh. sent me a TED talk. And he's like, Zubin, you're interested in consciousness. You should check this out. And uh, so I, uh, I looked at it. And it was your TED Talk okay. where you were saying, you know, it was about not seeing the truth. And I, went, I watched it and I said, oh, here's a scientist. So this is interesting, visual perception and how we don't really see things as they are. They're constructions of our mind. And not only that, but they're not even close to reality. They are purely iconic to help us survive. And we're not seeing the underlying reality on you present this really interesting case. And I remember yeah. having this moment, it was a red pill moment, right. where mm -hmm. right towards the end, I was like, I was just riveted. And at the end I said, oh my gosh, so what is reality? And you just said, I have a couple theories of what 
the world actually is, but we'll get to that another time or something like that. And I was like, right. no. So <laughs> then I went down the Don Hoffman rabbit hole and watched a lot of your lectures on what the theory is. So maybe we should back up and go, mm -hmm. you know, you study visual perception. Why is it that you're saying, and in this book, The Case Against Reality, you, you actually do this. You build a case chapter by chapter by chapter, starting with things like split brain experiments. Like how is it that you can cleave conscious experience in two? Right. Um, all the way up to how you know insects can go extinct by trying to have sex with a beer bottle because right. it <clears throat> fools their system into thinking that's a female, right. and all the way into quantum mechanics, general relativity, <clears throat> up to okay, everything we see is not what's actually happening. Can take us on this ride a little bit in the way you describe it. Right, and and also the reason why I take this ride, um, I actually published a book in 1998 called Visual Intelligence in which I actually put out the idea that this is all just a user interface. So the book- In 88? In uh, 98. 98, 1998. yeah. 1998. And in that book, the first nine chapters are sort of standard um, modern cognitive sciences approaches to visual perception. But in the last chapter, I go after this idea that we're seeing just an interface, not, not the truth. And my colleagues use the book as a textbook in various universities and so forth. They like the book, except that last chapter, they go, you know, Hoffman goes off the rails on the last <laughs> chapter. And, and I realized that there was only one way I was going to convince my scientific colleagues to at least take the idea seriously. Maybe not convince that I'm right, but, but take the idea seriously. And that was to use evolution by natural selection. If I could show that evolution by natural selection does not favor organisms that see reality as it is, then I would get their attention. And I thought immediately that maybe it would be because it, the truth is too complicated, it would take too much time and energy. Right. And it turns out that that's correct, but it's not the real deep, interesting reason. And it, so as I explored evolution by natural selection, I realized there was a deeper reason that I'd never understood before. And the reason is this, that, that fitness payoffs, which are like, it, evolution is like a video game. In a video game, you have to go running around in the screen as quickly as you can, grabbing points to try to get enough points to get to the next level. If you do, you get to the next level. If you don't, you die. In evolution, you're grabbing what they call fitness payoffs, but they're like the game points. And, you know, grabbing fitness payoffs that, you know, to food, the right mates, and so forth. But if you get enough, you don't yourself go to the next level. It's your genes that go to the next level in your offspring. And what I realized as I started studying this with my, my graduate students, um, Justin Mark and Brian Marion, we discovered that what's really going on is that the fitness payoffs themselves, which is what we're going to be tracking, that's what our senses are going to be telling us about. It turns out that the fitness payoffs themselves, in general, do not carry information about objective reality. They just tell you, you're about to die, you're about to get something that you're, you, you're good, you're bad, don't eat this, eat that. Have sex with this, don't have, have sex with that. Right. That's all they're telling you. Mm -hmm. They're not telling you about the truth. And I can say that more mathematically, they're not homomorphisms of reality. I mean, so for mathematicians, generically, fitness payoff functions are not homomorphisms of structures in objective reality. But, but intuitively, it's just that fitness payoffs um, aren't about the truth. They're about what you need to do to stay alive. And that, that secured it for me. That, that was... That was a surprise to me that I learned around 2008, 2009, that evolution was even further against seeing the truth than I'd ever imagined. And so I published a paper in 2010 uh, in the Journal of Theoretical Biology with my two graduate students where we announced the results of the simulations. We did hundreds of thousands of simulations, and we found that organisms that saw the truth in the simulations went extinct when they competed against organisms that saw none of the truth and were just tuned to fitness. This is equal complexity organisms. And so I proposed then that it was a theorem, that organisms that see reality as it is are never more fit than organisms of equal, equal complexity that see none, none of reality and are just tuned to fitness payoffs. And I went to a mathematician, Chetan Prakash, a, a longtime friend, who was actually there in 1986 when we were working on that mathematics. And I proposed this theorem to him and he's, he's a genius mathematician, and he was able to prove it. So he actually, so we actually have a theorem, and then we've done further mathematics where we actually show, yeah, in general, um, fitness payoffs destroy information about the structure of the world. 
And so, so it's a theorem. Organisms that see reality as it is cannot outcompete organisms of equal complexity that see none of reality and are just tuned to fitness payoffs. Okay, so let me reiterate this because um, it's important. And by the way, for people who want to get a more broad overview of all this, listen to the first show I did with Don, which was an audio-only podcast where we went through this whole arc of this. So we're going to go deeper in this episode. So this is for people who care deeply about the nature of reality, how we perceive it, uh, mm -hmm. consciousness and things like that from a scientific mm -hmm. standpoint. So what you're saying is that if an organism sees the world as it is, right. it will go extinct relative to an organism that right. only sees the world in a dumbed down way that hides most of what's actually going on, but only shows the organism what it needs, the bare minimum it needs to survive That's and right. to reproduce. Absolutely. So if you waste any of your perceptual time and energy on the truth, you are wasting your time and energy. It's not going to help you to stay alive, and you will not be able to outcompete organisms that spend none of their perceptual time and energy on the truth and only spend it on looking for the payoff points that help you win the game. So it's just like in a video game. If, if some guy is playing a video game, and he's just sort of looking around, enjoying everything, and, and trying to figure out how it works and so forth, looking at the pixels and so forth, he's going to lose to some other woman who is, you know, Focused on the fitness, on, on, the, on the points. On the game. On the game yeah. points and trying to get them and getting to the next level. So, you, you know, if, if you're dawdling around with anything but the payoffs, you lose. Right. And that makes perfect sense because uh, it's the same thing it, trying to understand then a video game. If right. you're looking at, you know, Grand Theft Auto, right. you're going, okay, so what I'm seeing here is a car and a bad guy and a this and that. Right, right. Is that really mm -hmm. what's there? And the... Um, you know, some people would say, yeah, no, that's there because they're, they're deluded. But right, then right. scientists would say, no, that's not what's there. Don't be stupid. What's there? Take out a magnifying glass and look at the screen. There right. are pixels there. Right, right, right. So what's really there are pixels. And then if you go back even deeper, you know, that it's the little tinier pixels. Right. And, and then if you go behind the screen, you'll see it's circuits and software that, you, that are hidden behind the whole screen itself. And is that the, in that analogy, is that the true nature of reality there? Is that base reality? Well, that, that shows the difference between what we're perceiving and whatever objective reality might, might be. Right. So it's, an, it's a good metaphor to help break, break us from the idea that, of course, we're seeing the truth. When, when we see an apple on the table or you know, we see the moon, it, it's just natural to think, oh, of course I'm seeing the truth. My friends see it, and they can see it when my eyes are closed, so of course I'm seeing the truth. And I'm saying, no, no, this is all just a, a headset, a virtual reality headset that we've got on. And I look at the moon, I render it, just like in virtual reality, I look over in Grand Theft Auto uh, with a virtual reality add-on. Um, I look at my, my steering wheel, and, and so I'm rendering a steering wheel. But now I look over there, I'm no longer rendering a steering There is no steering wheel because I'm not creating a steering wheel. There is still, in that metaphor, the circuits and software and all the program of Grand Theft Auto that I'm not seeing at all. I'm just seeing the stuff that I render as I look around. I see cars and steering wheels and so forth. And not only that, but if you saw the circuits, if you saw the base reality, the objective, the thing mm -hmm. in and of itself, <laughs> Right. you would not be able to play or survive in the game. Right. right. The guy that just sees the, the steering wheel and, and the gas pedal and so forth will beat me. If I'm in there trying to toggle voltages in the computer to try to win the game, good luck. You know, I won't be able to do it quickly enough. Now, it's important to understand this. There's a few things you said here that will make people go, wait. It made Einstein go, wait. Mm -hmm. So you're saying the moon doesn't exist when I don't look. That's exactly right. That space and time it, themselves do not exist independent of us. So most of us think that space-time is fundamental reality and all the objects inside space-time are, are part of, are on the stage, this pre-existing stage of space-time. And I'm saying that this, that, that whole idea is, is wrong, that space-time is something that you create in this moment. You're the author of space-time. You're not a bit player that's shown up 14 billion years later after this stage was set. So we are the authors of space and time and all the objects that we see. We're not bit players in space time. Space and time are constructs of our inner face. Absolutely. Now, but here's the, so this is where it becomes very solipsistic if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. solipsism meaning that, no, I am the only thing that exists and I create the world and everybody else is a figment of my imagination and so on. How is this different than that? Yes, I'm, I'm not a solipsist. So a solipsist would say that, as you said, that, um, yeah, we're creating all this and there's nothing but me and my creation. And 
I'm saying that there are other consciousnesses out there. I'm talking with you. I believe that you're you're not just a figment of my imagination. Why, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it means a lot to me. That's right. And I'm not a figment of your imagination. And that, that you know, that that puts certain responsibilities on me. I, even though what I perceive is just an icon of, of Zubin, I need to be very, very careful how I treat that icon because in interacting with that icon, I could literally cause pain to the consciousness of Zubin and you could cause pain to me. So our interface gives us a genuine portal to other consciousnesses, all human consciousnesses. My cats they're my, are my icons, but I believe that my cat icons um, are portals to real conscious creatures that, again, I don't want to hurt. And a mouse, ants, and so forth, it goes all... The interface, I, I claim, is all to other consciousnesses, but the interface is like a visualization tool. Hmm. And of course, a visualization tool is there to sort of hide the complexity and dumb things down and so forth, because we don't, we'd be overwhelmed by all the consciousnesses out there. And so that's what space-time is. It's a visualization tool. Okay, so there's a lot there, but one thing I want to ask, because I know this comes up a lot, well, why, Don, and again, for people who really want to go deep on this, read the book, why, Don, is it that, why can't you just say, you know, yeah, okay, we're not seeing the truth. Maybe we're just seeing part of the truth. Maybe we're seeing a dumbed down version of what's actually there. Maybe there is a dawn in space and time, but we're only seeing enough of it that uh, we need to see to survive. We don't see infrared, we don't see microwaves, we don't see x-rays. I can't see at the you know microscopic you know quark level, but the stuff exists, we're just seeing some of it, and wouldn't that help us survive? And that's what most of my colleagues would say. They would say, of course evolution didn't shape us to see all of the truth. It only shaped us to see those parts of objective reality that we need to stay alive. And so that's the standard view. And, and what I'm saying is that if you look at the mathematics of evolution, very, very carefully, it's called evolutionary game theory. Mm. We don't have to wave our hands about this. So to my scientific colleagues who are thinking intuitively about evolution, of course they know evolutionary game theory is a precise mathematical model. And when you look at that mathematics, it says very, very clearly that it's not the case that we're seeing just those parts of the truth that we need. We're seeing none of the truth, almost surely. We're seeing entirely a user interface. And, and the whole point of a user interface, like, like for example, again, Grand Theft Auto, right? The whole point, there's nothing in what you see in Grand Theft Auto that in any way resembles the circuits and software and voltages that in that metaphor is the reality. There's just no resemblance whatsoever. And that's not a problem. That's, in fact, an advantage. It allows you to control the reality, even though you're completely ignorant about its true nature. And that's what evolution has done for us. I'm, I'm saying we're not seeing just little bits of the truth that we need. We're seeing none of the truth. And that's what allows us to control the truth effectively, because we don't know anything about the truth. It would be too complicated. And it's just not what we, we, we need, simple eye candy that lets us do what we need to do.